All right. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Introduction to Kubernetes Workshop by Ambassador Lab. My name is Ejidi Angasipo. I am a developer advocate at Ambassador Lab, and I will be facilitating today's workshop. Here's a quick overview of what we're going to cover today, and it is my hope that at the end of this workshop, you'll be able to understand the meaning of Kubernetes and its basic concept. You'd learn how to configure your local development environment for Kubernetes using Kind and QB. We'd also learn how to package code into containers with Docker, would improve your, your coding feedback loop with telepresence, and finally learn how to perform continuous integration with GitHub Actions. So if you have any questions during this workshop, please drop it in the chat and either Daniel or I would be happy to respond to you as soon as possible. Or if you can't access that, you could also join our Slack channel, um, the Jeff House channel on our Slack. So like I mentioned, please click on the links to this slide so that you can have access to any links that I mentioned during this, um, during this workshop. There are a couple of requirements I'd love for you to have to fully understand every single thing that is being said and also get hands-on as well, because we hope that this is going to be a very practical hands-on workshop. I'm not just going to be talking. I would give you an opportunity to ask questions, try out stuff yourself, and ensure that you, I mean, have a sense of what Kubernetes is and how it works before you leave this workshop today. So the first thing we'd love for you to have is Docker and kubectl installed on your computer. If you don't have that, please click on the links here and here to download it into your, um, your computer. And then we'll also be using a tool, a CNCF tool called Telepresence to improve our um, coding feedback loop. And that requires a, an ambassador cloud account, right? So that's why you also need to create an ambassador cloud account. So if you don't have that already, do, do well to click on this link, or you can go to a8r.io slash workshop, and you should be able to create the um, accounts directly. It would also be super helpful if you have some basic knowledge of Docker and how to use your terminal, as some of the things we'll be seeing in this workshop would be would revolve around that will also be done directly on our terminal. Cool. Um, this minions represent how excited I am to be facilitating this workshop. And I hope you're just as excited to be learning about Kubernetes today. It is an absolutely fantastic thing to know in this time. And um, I will jump right into it to like kickstart the workshop. Cool. Um, I know I literally just said we should jump right into it, but I believe it would be more beneficial if I explain the meaning of Kubernetes using this flow rather than just defining Kubernetes, right? So on a high level of a view, building cloud native applications follow this format where you have to build the application using your preferred programming language. It could be anything, Java, JavaScript, whatever your preferred programming language is. And then after you've done that, the next step would be to create a container image. Right. And then you're probably wondering, OK, what is a container image? Because you're probably just hearing about it for the first time. So a container image basically carries every single information that can create a working container. So think of it this way. You've built this awesome application, right? And it's on your VS Code or IntelliJ, whatever IDE you use. And you want someone, let's say you want um, your colleague who is using. So let's say you're using a Windows. Yeah. And you want your colleague who is using a Mac OS to be able to access this application. Previously, that your colleague would have to install all the different tools that you've used. Keep in mind that you're using a Windows machine, right? So the things you installed doesn't apply to that colleague because the colleague is using a Mac OS or a Linux, for instance, yeah? So he or she, like they would have to manually download all of those things, get it set up, get it running before they can access your application. But with containerization, it absolutely doesn't matter. All you need to do is create a container image that contains every single thing that application needs to work from the runtime configuration, the code base, the source, actual source code. And then once your teammates actually uses that container image, they can create a working container and be able to access your application directly from their computer without stress, without any complicated um, procedure. So this may look um, a bit too much, but when we go through the different steps and actually see the stuff in the workshop, you get to see or have a better understanding of how 
containerization works. So after you've created this container image, you'd have to push it to a registry like Docker Hub or Quay by Red Hat. And then you can now pull back that um, container image and use it to create a running container. That's one route. And then the other route is to just create the container image and then immediately use it to create a working container without pushing it to Docker Hub or Quay. So it's totally your choice. And it's also dependent on what you're trying to achieve at the moment. So after, so let's assume you have um, a couple of containers running, right? People can now access your application. Every, everything is going well, but just like everything in life, this container is bound to fail or have some kind of downtime or anything can happen. And if, let's, if, if this was one container, then it's easy for you to come back and like, hey, I'll quickly fix this and go back. But then you really, it's like it's, it really happens where you have like a cognitive application that has one container or like one, one microservice, for instance. Or what if you were sleeping or let's say watching a Netflix movie or doing whatever it is that you, you find to be fun for you, right? And you realize that people can no longer access your application anymore because the container is down. It means you have to interrupt whatever it is you were doing, run back to your computer and quickly fix it. And nobody wants to do that, trust me, it's not, it's not nice. And then this is actually where Kubernetes comes in. So Kubernetes serves as a container orchestrator that helps you automate, deploy, scale, and manage containerized applications. So if one of your container goes down, Kubernetes can help you spin that container back up again. Or let's assume that one of your container isn't um, following the health check you set up for it. Kubernetes can help you pretty much like stop sending traffic to that container and only spin it back up when it is working the way it's supposed to work. So if that definition of Kubernetes did not do it for you, like you probably don't still understand what Kubernetes is, I bet this one would give you the aha moment you're looking for. So let's, let's think of a football team. If you are listening to me from North America, you probably know a football team as a soccer team. So when I say football, I'm actually referring to soccer. And if I say soccer, then it's football. Or maybe I'll just say football stroke soccer so it can make sense for you. So think of a football or soccer team, right? We usually have 11 players and a coach. So this is Barcelona, which is actually my favorite football soccer team, right? And um, the different players have different responsibilities. There are people who are expected to defend the goalpost. There are people who are expected to score. There's also the goalkeeper that is like, couple of other interesting um, specific things that everybody's expected to do, right? And they have the coach. This coach is in charge of all these 11 players. He tells them what to do. If one of the players has an injury, for instance, the coach would say, hey, we need to change this player and put in another player. Does that make sense? So now think of the players as containers, 11 containers, and then think of this coach as Kubernetes. So Kubernetes basically manages the different containers, tell them what, what to do. If anything happens to one of them, Kubernetes can help you. Sorry, okay. If anything happens to one of the, uh, one of the containers, just like if one of the player has an injury, Kubernetes can like take that player out, for instance, and, and replace it with another player. So it's pretty much removing this container and moving the traffic to a different continent that is actually working. Yeah, so that's pretty much the relationship between Kubernetes and containers. So now that you know the meaning of Kubernetes, you're probably wondering, okay, how can Kubernetes help me code and ship faster? And to be honest, I do not blame you at all because the goal of every developer is to ship code as fast as possible to their end users. So I'm going to quickly explain that here. The, development, the developer experience has fundamentally shifted as developers now assume an active role in managing the full life cycle of an application, right? That's from the coding, testing, releasing, and deploying. Previously, developers were not actually involved in this aspect of the life cycle. But because this, this aspect of the life cycle has changed, the way software ships has also changed as well. Development teams now have the ability to code and ship faster using Kubernetes because it provides new and efficient ways that support incremental release of functionalities to end users. So you can quickly change the service 
fix something, push it without ha- having to wait for the entire system to be updated or fixed. These are some of the benefits Kubernetes gives you as a developer. So far, we've talked about the meaning of Kubernetes and how Kubernetes can help you code and ship faster. In this section, I'm going to explain some of the basic concepts you need to know to get started with Kubernetes. This is in no way covering all of the concepts, but if you know these concepts, it's like a very great start. I would, it's, they're like concepts that you would always hear of whenever you're interacting with Kubernetes or containerization. So the first one on the list is a pod. So remember when I was talking about the flow of um, building cloud implementation? If you can't remember, remember, let me remind you. I said you had to build that application using your preferred programming language, create a container image, which is pretty much containerizing it. And then Kubernetes then orchestrates those different containers. But one thing I didn't mention was that in order for these containers to run on Kubernetes, needed to be wrapped around something called a pod, right? So think of it this way. Let's assume you want to send um, sneakers to your friend who is living in a different country, right? So let's assume you stay in the United States and you want to send sneakers to your friend who's living in India, for instance. The ideal process would be to pack up the sneakers inside a box and then go to the shipping company who would then put this box inside a shipping container here and ship it down to your friend, right? So now let's assume that that sneakers was code and the box is the container. Right, So you need to put the code inside the container, which is containerizing it. And in order for you to reach your friend, which is in this case, in order for you to work on Kubernetes, you need to put it inside a pod. And then that pod would then make it work on Kubernetes. So think the same flow, sneakers, box. The goal here is to give it to your friend. And in order for your friend to receive it, it needs to be put into a shipping container. In terms of Kubernetes, in order for the container to run on Kubernetes, it needs to be put into a more like wrapped around something called a pod. There's another awesome concept you should know, which is called nodes. And usually, like I mentioned, Kubernetes runs your application by placing its containers inside the pods. These pods actually run on nodes. And ideally nodes can either be a virtual or physical machine. So a quick pointer here is that from this section forward, there are a couple of commands that I'm going to be running on my terminal. It's, most, it's possible that you may not catch all of them immediately. So if you want to see the cheat sheet and all the commands used in this workshop, please click on this um, link here to assess it. You'd see the different commands and different um, meanings for all of them. So if there's any point where you probably miss what I said or you're not following up immediately, you could always use that cheat sheet to work through the different commands. So if I wanted to see the nodes running on my computer, what I would do is go to my computer and then run kubectl get nodes. And what this would do is show me the nodes running on my computer. Just going to take a few seconds. Let me call video. Mm. All right, cool. So why is this not working? Okay. So if you do keep CTL gets nodes, it would just give it a few minutes. I wonder why it's taking a bit of time. It shouldn't take that long. But what this would ideally do is show you the nodes running on this computer. And in this case, you'd see. So let me just quickly cancel this and open up a new one. This, okay, I need to enlarge this. And then this is your, open, so yeah, that should work. Um, has, has anybody been able to try this directly on their um, computer? kubectl gets notes. I, I don't know why it's not working. I don't know if it's 
because there's a lot of load on my computer right now. Just checking it, Have you got the context set, right? Yeah, yeah. I do have that set. Because I've done that a few times. <laughs> In yeah, then that's my desktop, so it should work. Read how all the other commands are working and this isn't. All right, so we'll just go ahead. Um, maybe that will probably work in a couple of seconds. I bet it's because there's like a lot of load on my PC at the moment, but I'm not, I don't know for sure. All right, so um, ideally that would have shown me the nodes I have running on my computer, right? Which would have been Docker desktop. And then you also see that it has um, a worker node and a master node as well. And then we have something called a cluster. So a cluster is a collection of nodes for running containerized applications, meaning that you could have more than one node, right? Which is running, which a pod is running on. And usually every cluster has several worker nodes and at least one master node. The worker nodes is actually what hosts the pods, while the master node um, basically manages the worker node and the pods as well. That's pretty much trying to ensure that everything is working the way it's supposed to work. So far, we've covered um, some concepts around Kubernetes, right? And the first thing we talked about was containers. And we said that in order for these containers to work on Kubernetes, it needed to be wrapped around something called a pod. And then we also mentioned that this pod runs on nodes, right? So now I can see the container here wrapped around the pod, and then the pod is placed on the node. And then we said that a cluster is a collection of one or more nodes, meaning that this node now is inside a cluster or this node is what makes up a cluster. If you looked at my previous slide, you probably think, oh, you needed to have just one container inside a pod or just one pod inside a node, but that's not actually the case. You could actually have two or more containers inside a pod and a node could actually hold more than one pod as well. You could also have two or more nodes in a cluster. So it can be as many as possible. It always depends on your needs and what you're trying to achieve as a developer or someone who is part of a development team. Then we also have something called namespaces. In Kubernetes, namespaces provide a, me a mechanism for isolating groups of resources within a single cluster. I mean, usually in development teams are different in a company, right? They're different teams. So they could be like, let's say the front end team or the back end team or the authentication team. It could be like different depending on what kind of company you're working in. And assuming this company is using one Kubernetes cluster, it would be ideal to create different namespaces for them. So if I have a namespace named front end for my team, I know that whatever I'm doing is done inside the front end namespace and not the back end namespace. So there would not be a possibility where I do something that affects the backend team, right? So let's say maybe I push an object that the backend team doesn't need into the um, backend namespace. So this basically helps you create some sort of isolation for each team. So if we wanted to check the different um, namespaces I have on my cluster, I would do kubectl. I hope that works, get namespaces. Uh, so we don't know. Okay, switching to a different um, GPTL. All right, so let's try that again.
Hey, Eddie Dunga, I see someone's put in the chat. I was thinking the same thing. Santosh is put in the chat. Okay, I think Doc, Doc, Doc is hanging, I reckon. Yeah, <laughs> I think, I think yeah. so. So let me try, let me try restarting a Doc at C. You've got to love live demos, right? Always full of danger. Yeah. Um, let me try to Yep, so it's currently restarting. So I think we'll just take this time to answer questions if we have any. And by then, hopefully, Docker should be running. So let me go through the chat. Um, Donald, do, you, do we have any questions you've not responded to already? We're looking good at Didong. Yeah, we had a couple of questions and I've uh, pinged some answers back. Um, folks okay. are mostly wondering where to get started. So I've given them a link to your slides. Uh, we should be good. Okay. All right, cool. Is anybody that has any other question about what has been said so far? Do you want to, do you understand what Kubernetes means yet on a high level or do you have any um, questions you want to ask? I think there's an option to turn on your mic to ask the question or you could just like drop a message in chat. Hi, Eddie Jung. Hi. Good evening. So, um, sorry, I got in a little bit late and um, so I just have like, an overview of what um, Kubernetes is like. It's an orchestration of containers, but as, aside that, I, I'm not really sure um, my knowledge exceeds that. So I don't really know what has um, what, what you like gone through. So I think I heard him say he, you shared a link. I don't know if you could share that again. Yes, just give me a second to find that link and share it. I did copy that. All right, I just sent the link to the slides and chats. Can you access it now? Yes, I can. Thank you. All right, cool. There is a question, uh, Didiong from Asimo. Um, what setup do I need to make after installing kubectl? All right, so um, we've not really done a lot after kubectl, but ideally if you install Docker, it would automatically install kubectl for you. So the first thing that you would try is try to run kubectl get node. So if you go to this slide, um, this slide here, you can click on the cheat sheet here, right? So if you click on the cheat sheet, it's going to open a doc that has a couple of commands that we're running in this um, workshop. And then in that um, document, you'd see the different commands we've run, we've run so far. So you'd see kubectl gets those will basically show you the different nodes you have available in your Kubernetes cluster. So you can try to run that and let me know if you have any issues along the way. All right, so it seems Docker has restarted. So let me quit my terminal and do that restarted as well. Yeah, that was the issue. <laughs> okay, uh, so it seems we are back on track now. Um, so to get uh, confused. Okay, All right, cool. So, um, the person that asked the question around kubectl, have you been able to run kubectl gets nodes on your computer? Um, so maybe we can just drop drop what's going on on the chat and then I'll check it out um, before I continue. But yeah, so like I mentioned before, when my Docker wasn't working, so if you wanted to see the different nodes that are available in your cluster, you'd run kubectl gets nodes, right? So that what I would show you is the name of the node, 
um, the status and you can see that it's ready here. The different roles, like I mentioned, not, sorry, excuse me, not usually have like worker nodes and master nodes. Then you also see the age as well. Like how long has this been available on my um, computer? And you can see that's 119 days. So if you're just doing this for the first time, if, you're just, if you just installed Docker on your computer, it will probably show like a couple of hours or a couple of days, depending on what you have. All right. So a uh, quick reminder about what namespaces are. Namespaces help you isolate certain sections, like subsections of your cluster to enable different teams use it effectively without affecting other teams. So if I wanted to check the namespaces I have on this um, Docker desktop cluster, I would do kubectl get name spaces. I wonder that would do show me the different namespaces I have. So you can see I have a namespace named ambassador, which I created myself. And then there's the default namespace, which is created automatically by um, Kubernetes. I can see that people are raising their hands. So just give me a few more minutes. We'll reach a point where you can ask questions. So you can ask the questions then. All right. So um, like I mentioned, default is where every namespace you create and you don't assign this. Every object you create and you don't assign a specific namespace would get there automatically. I mean, we all know what default is, right? So every other aspect of like tools or frameworks, when you don't specify something, it goes to a default space. So in Kubernetes, if you don't specify where, the, where you want the object or the resource to go to, Kubernetes will automatically put it inside the default namespace. And then the kube node list is basically holds the list for every object inside the Kubernetes cluster. The kube public is created automatically and it's usually accessible by every single person who, who tries to access it. Then we also have kube system which holds the different objects created by the Kubernetes system. So when we go further into this workshop, I'll show you how you can have a namespace in a particular place and not have it in the other one, right? Because it doesn't exist. And if you can't access it, it means that you cannot do something wrong, right? So if you're in the front end team, you cannot access the namespaces in the back end team. There is no chance or possibility for you to do something that will affect the back end team and the other way around. So this is an example or this is a usage where it makes it very easy for development teams to use a shared cluster. All right, the next thing we're going to talk about is context. So usually a context includes a cluster, a user and a namespace. And then the current context is where your kubectl commands actually run. If you remember when I had that issue with Docker, Daniel was asking if I had set up my context because sometimes if you don't set up your context well or you don't do it in the right place, it's possible that you're not able to access some certain resources. So if I wanted to switch between contexts in this um, cluster, what I would do is kubectl um, config get slash context. And what that will do is show me the different contexts I have available in my cluster. As you can see, I have Docker desktop, a GKE um, context, and also a kind Kubernetes workshop context. And if you check well, you see this asterisk sign here is showing that I am currently on the Docker desktop context. So every single command, whatever I'm doing right now, is only going to work on this context and not this one, right? So if I wanted to switch to, let's say, kind Kubernetes workshop, I would do kubectl. Um, config, and then use context, then mention the name of the context I want to switch to, which in this case could be kind Kubernetes workshop. And you can see now it said switch to context kind Kubernetes workshop. So if we run the first command again, we see that that asterisk sign is now showing on kind Kubernetes workshop, meaning that I am no longer on the Docker desktop context. So if you wanted to do kubectl get namespaces, you'd see that we will not be able to see the ambassador namespace anymore. Remember when we were on the kubectl context, we could see the ambassador namespace here. But if I run this, you can no longer see it. You can only see the emoji voter namespace and the other default namespaces created by Kubernetes. So again, just to iterate, imagine if, the Docker desktop context was front end, and this one is back end. So if you don't have access to it, you cannot, nothing can go wrong. I mean, certain teams can focus on what you are doing without affecting other teams. So let's quickly switch back to Docker desktop. 
before we go ahead. And then finally, there's something called deployment. I mean, as a developer, right, when you hear deployment, you're probably thinking, oh, hey, I need to deploy this app, I need to do this thing. But in Kubernetes, deployment actually define how pods should be deployed and how Kubernetes should manage the deployment. And it, and it uses a declarative approach. So Kubernetes works in two ways, right? A declarative approach and an imperative approach. So far, most of the things we've done right now is using the imperative approach where we're like, hey, Kubernetes, I need you to do this. I need you to show me the context. I need you to um, show, switch to, to this particular context. That has imperative. I'm telling you what I want you to do. Like, literally do this thing for me right now. And then declarative on the other hand is saying, hey, this is what I want to achieve. You're not saying do this now. You're just telling Kubernetes what you want to achieve. And in that process, Kubernetes will literally do the, follow the different steps it needs to take to help you achieve whatever you set to it. So if you say, hey, I need two replicas, for instance, Kubernetes would run the different processes that will enable you to have two replicas of your pod. But imperative on the other hand is literally saying, kubectl creates these replicas. I don't think that makes sense. So deployments enable you work with Kubernetes in the declarative approach. I'm going to, there's a point where we're going to test a sample application. So in that part, I will show you what a YAML file looks like and how the de declarative approach works. All right, so we'll just stop for a second and answer questions. And after we answer questions, we're going to move to how to set up your local development environment for Kubernetes. So pretty much like, once you've installed Docker Desktop and kubectl, what next? How can you actually use Kubernetes effectively in your development workflow? So um, there was someone who raised um, hand. I don't know if that person has been responded to. I think it was Francis. I've been answering a few questions where I can, Adi Jong. I think, um, okay. so just checking with Francis, it looks like, um, oh, Seems like Kubernetes were turned off, so he's just in it. Yeah, good stuff, Francis. Um, the if for folks are following along, sometimes when you install Docker Desktop, it doesn't enable Kubernetes. So once you've installed Docker, uh, you need to go to the Preferences menu in the menu bar and make sure yeah. in the dashboard. That's, yeah, cheers, Young. Make, make sure that um, that Kubernetes is running in in the dashboard that's shown. Yes. Yeah, so um, let me quickly show you that. So if you go to Docker Desktop. You'd see, oh, sorry, let me close this. Um, so you go to the settings and you'd see Kubernetes. So what you have to do is click on this enable Kubernetes, which would enable Kubernetes on your computer because it, it just enables Docker automatically, but not Kubernetes. So if I go to the Docker icon here, you can see that Docker desktop is running and Kubernetes is running as well. So you need to see these two things in order to effectively use um, kubectl on your terminal. <clears throat> All right, so I will go ahead then. Um, I believe Daniel would be answering the question so we could just like meet up with time. All right, so in this section, I'm going to show you how to set up your local development environment for Kubernetes. We're going to be using a tool called Kind so you, if you're following along right now, please click on the install and create a Kubernetes cluster using Kind URL. That would take us to the homepage of Kind. So Kind is actually an acronym for Kubernetes in Docker, meaning that you need to have Docker installed on your computer to be able to use Kind as well. And what it basically does is gives us the ability to create um, Kubernetes clusters. So if you wanted to use it, um, click on the quick start guide and click on installation. Here, you see the different ways you can install Kind into your um, computer. So I love using Brew, but feel free to use any other um, preferred method. If you're using a Linux, there's an option of how to install it. If you're using Windows, there's also an option as well. So I'm going to copy this command, which is Brew install Kind, because I'm using a Mac OS and um, Homebrew is literally the package manager I use. So if I go back to my terminal and paste that, it's going to, first of all, update Brew for me since I already have Brew installed. And then let me know that I already have Kind installed on my computer because I've done that already. So I did that prior to this talk because I didn't want it to 
take a lot of time and make us not finish immediately. So you can see here it's saying one in kind 0 0.11.1 is already installed and up to date, meaning that I already have kind installed. But in your case, since you don't have kind installed, it's going to install kind into your computer. Right. So after you've installed kind, the next thing you want to do is create a cluster. Remember, the, what we're trying to do here is create a local development environment for Kubernetes. And we've talked about clusters, we've talked about containers and pods, right? And how all of these things run inside the cluster. So you need to have a cluster first to be able to run a pod on it or like even like run a container inside Kubernetes. Yeah. So now that we have kind installed on our computer, you just scroll down and you scroll down, you go to this section that says creating a cluster. So like, like it's written here, creating a Kubernetes cluster with kind is as simple as kind create cluster. So you just go to your terminal and, and write up kind create cluster. But what that would do is create a cluster named kind automatically. So I said by default, this cluster will be named kind. So if you want your cluster to have a specific name, so let's say you're working for a company named um, AirPods, right? And then you want your cluster to be named AirPods for some reason. So you, that in that situation, you run kind create cluster dash dash name AirPods because you want to specify the name for this Kubernetes cluster. So I'm going to do that. Um, so I'm going to copy the command here, go back to my terminal and paste that. So as you can see, it's kind create cluster. But I don't want this to create a normal, um, I don't want this to create it with the default name. So I'm going to add the name flag and then mention the name that I want it to create, which is Kubernetes Workshop. And because I already have this installed, you would throw an error saying, hey, uh, nodes already exist for this cross-standing Kubernetes workshop. But in your case, it would also download or more like create the cluster for you. So feel free to add dash dash name and whatever cluster you want it to be. If you don't, if you're not really keen on having a specific name, then all you need to do is run kind create cluster. So it all depends on what you want to do. So now that we have this cluster created, it means we can start diving deep and like doing other fun and interesting things with Kubernetes since we have a cluster. And like I mentioned, um, I mentioned earlier about like context, context and how we had to like switch between certain contexts from like Docker desktop to Kubernetes workshop to G um, Google Kubernetes engines cluster, right? So we're going to install this tool called QB that helps us make this process a lot easier. So I'm going to click on that link and scroll down. So QB is basically a tool that helps with context switching, namespace switching, and prompt uh, modification. So in order to install QB, I'll click on installation. I will also choose my preferred um, way of installing, which is using Homebrew. So I'll copy, brew, install QB, go to my terminal, and let me just quickly clear my terminal because everything is down right now. All right, so I will come here and run that. So what this would do is install QB into my um, computer. It will take a few seconds. All right, awesome, QB is installed. So let's take a step back. Remember when I wanted to do context switching, I had to run kubectl config get context to just see the context. But with, QB, with QB, all you need to do is just run kubectx. And then you can see the different context on your, uh, in your cluster. So it makes things faster. And as developers, we want to be able to ship software as soon as possible. So we don't need anything that is going to waste our time. We want to focus on the actual code, right? So this tool makes it a lot easier for you. And aside from that, there's also another tool you can install named FZF, which basically makes QB a lot more interactive and improves the UI. So to do that, you scroll down to the user section and click on FZF. Once you do that, it will be redirected to the GitHub repository. And what I'm going to do is um, go to the installation guide. And I'm still going to use Homebrew as well. So I'll copy that. Go back to my terminal and run it. So you can see brew install FZF. Again, this will take a couple of seconds to install or minutes, depending on how strong your internet is. All right, so I have FZF. So remember, at first when we ran QBCTX, it just showed me the different um, 
um, cross styles or different contexts, right? So if I wanted to go choose a specific one, I'll have to say QBC CTX and then name, like choose, or rather write the name of the um, context I want to access. Just like when we did kubectl, use, um, get config and all of that. But now that we have QB and FZF installed on our computer, if I do kubectx again, it's now going to show something like a UI, UI, right? And I can just move up and down and easily choose whichever context I want, which is amazing, makes things a lot easier. So previously, I was on the Docker desktop context. But what I want to do right now is switch to the Kubernetes um, workshop context. So if I switch to that, you'd see that it now shows, hey, that I'm on the kind Kubernetes workshop context on the default namespace. Another interesting thing about this is it lets you see where you're currently on. Without QB and um, SZF, all you could see was like the home directory, which was the DDR SQL, right? You couldn't see what context you were on. So it's possible that you will probably be thinking you're on the production context, but deep down you're actually on the staging context and you now push something to production that we're not supposed to push. So QB helps you makes things a lot clearer. So now I know for sure that I'm inside the Kubernetes workshop. I know for sure that I'm inside the um, testing context. I will not mistakenly put something into production. So now that we are on this, uh, now we've been able to install QB and um, SDF, let's quickly see how we can deploy a sample application into our Kubernetes cluster. So if you go back to our slide, So you want to slide, click on deploy the emoji voto sample application. And when we go there, you'd see this awesome application that was built by the amazing folks at Buoyant. So we, let's quickly look at the deployment. Remember we talked about deployment and how it uses the declarative approach where you're literally telling Kubernetes what you want it to do. You're not saying do this now, you're like, this is what I want. So you let Kubernetes do the stuff for you. So let's look at a quick deployment file to see how that works. So click on deployment and let's try the booting the YAML file. So this is what a YAML file looks like. And it uses the declarative approach. So instead of you to say, kubectl creates this object, you're creating a YAML file and telling Kubernetes how you want this YAML file to be. So here, for instance, you add the kind which is basically manages the processes of that pod. And then the API version of the software so creating, which is version one, could be anything. Then for instance, you can see the metadata here, which is the name of this YAML file, the name of the object you're trying to create, which is voting. And you can also see that we have a specific namespace here called emoji voto, right? Meaning that once we create this um, or add these deployment files, we want them to be added into the emoji voto namespace and not to the default namespace. Meaning that if I am in the default namespace, I won't be able to access any of these resources because they are in a different namespace called Emoji Boto. So that's pretty much how um, deployment file works. Another interesting thing to spot out here is replicas. They're basically saying, I want this, um, um, so to have like just one replica. So if you mentioned two, it will create two replicas of the port for you. Ideally, you would have done this, not ideally, but if you wanted to, you have done this thing directly by yourself. But again, think of it, imagine if you're doing this for 100 services or 1,000 services, you do not want to do that. And this is how Kubernetes makes it a lot easier for you. You just tell you what you want and then it does it for you automatically. So let's go back to the actual repository. And how the declarative approach works is once you write this YAML file, you need to apply it into the cluster using a kubectl that's apply um, command. So let's scroll down to find that command. Yes, yeah, so this is it, kubectl apply dash k and then the name of the deployment file. What you're basically saying is, hey, Kubernetes, I want you to apply all of these objects that I've created into this cluster. So even if I did not build this thing myself, I do not have to download uh, whatever the um, forks and um, buoyants used to build this application. All I want is to run it on my computer without any stress. So if I copy this, I think I, I do have this already. So let me try to delete. Um, I think I should add. Mm 
transformer physical grid into something like so. It means like I said, you have to delete before that. So I, I already have um keep detail. I already have the emoji button namespace on my computer. And what I want to do is delete it so you can literally see it get installed, get applied into my cluster afresh so you'd understand the entire process. So just give it a few seconds to get deleted. Um, I can notice that Frank was still raising up his hand. I don't know if his issue has been fixed. Oh, okay. Frank, have you been able to figure out what's wrong? Or are you still experiencing any issue? No, I'm good now. I'm running, I'm following you. Okay, awesome. Fantastic. All right, so it does take a while to delete um, namespaces because of what might be running in there, but just so you can follow along. So if you go to that repository that I mentioned, copy this um, URL, go back to your terminal and then paste it. So when you do that, we see that it, it applies the different resources in that namespace. All right, the nature has been deleted. So I'll just paste that here and just wait for a couple of seconds or minutes at most, depending on how um, the resources you have on your computer. Awesome. So now you've seen that it has created a namespace called Emoji Boto, created a service account called Emoji, and also created several deployment files as well, based on what was inside the deployment folder we looked at. So now if I wanted to see these different resources, I'll do kubectl get all and what this actually does is shows me the different resources or objects in the default um, um namespace remember i mentioned that if you're in a particular namespace you can't access things in the other namespace what i actually wanted to access was all of these objects resources that i've created but because i didn't specify um the namespace that i wanted to use it made it um like I couldn't see it, right? So in order for you to access specific things in a particular namespace, you'd need to specify what namespace you're trying to access. So to do this again, I actually get the stuff in the emoji voto namespace. I would have to specify that. So come here and say that's end emoji voto get all. Awesome. So now because I've specified the namespace, you can actually see the different resources in this namespace. You can see the pods, the services, the deployment, and the replica sets. Remember when I showed you the YAML file, you could, you could see that the replica had one. So if, if, it, if it was specified, if, if we had written two there, for instance, we would have created two replica sets of each of the pods. So ideally, if we wanted to access this application on our computer, what we would have to do is expose it because pods are usually mapped to a private IP. And another interesting thing to know is that um, pods are like inferior, like they, they die, right? And when they die and get spinned back up again, more often than not, the IP address or the ID for that particular pod can change. And imagine if you had like a front end, um, like two, two pods that are working directly with each other. If one of the ID of that, of one of the pods change, it would be hard for you to manually go and find the name of the new ID and like replace it. So that's why we use something called services. Services basically serve as a secure location or as a certain a stagnant or static IP address that would not change. So even if these pods die and get restarted again, you can still access it with the service. So now, for instance, we have a pod named Emoji and we have a service named Emoji Service. So even if this pod die and get restarted with a new ID, you don't need to worry. You can still access this pod via the Emoji Service, right? So if I want, on a normal day, I'll probably say, okay, here, let me copy this cluster IP, right? And go to my terminal so that I can access the um, application. But that's not going to work because all the stuff happens privately, right? Um, the connection and the IP is not privately to port. So in order for us to expose it externally so that we can access it on our computer, we need to use a command called port forwarding. So if you go to the cheat sheets, like I mentioned, all of the commands I'm using here are available in this cheat sheet here. So if you cannot quickly um, follow through, please click here and assess the cheat sheet. All right, so if we, to do that, you would run kubectl 
and then we need to specify um, what namespace we're currently trying to ask so what namespace we want to run this um, this stuff on. So just give me a second. Okay, so we'll do kipctl namespace, which is emoji voto, emoji voto. So we're saying kipctl one is one of this namespace. We're saying port forward. The name of the service, which in this case is service slash web. SDC and what port you want to access it externally. So I want to access it on 8080. And to do that, you already have the internal um, port here, which is 80. So you say 8080 for external port, then include the internal um, port as well, which is 80. So if we run this, you see that it's saying forwarding from 127.0.0.1 to 8080. So if you go to your local host right now, So if we go to localhost 8080, you'd see that we've not been able to access the emoji voter application directly in our computer. So for context, this was not something we built. We don't have the source code of this application on our computer, we don't. But with the power of containerization and Kubernetes, we've been able to run this application directly in our cluster on our computer. So we can like test it, see how it works, give feedback to what our colleagues or whosoever built the app and quickly move on to the next thing. Awesome, so next session, um, not sure if anyone has any questions, just quickly check and if not, I'll go back to the next slide. All right, cool. All right, so um, in this next session, we'll talk about how to actually perform containerization. And after this, we'll go on a quick 10 minutes break, then get back and talk about how to use telepresence and continuous integration with GitHub Actions. Those are really going to be fantastic sessions. So do take a 10 minutes break after this last slide and come back. All right, so when I started this workshop, I talked about the flow of cloud native applications. You use your program, preferred programming language to build it, containerize it, put it, wrap it around the pod and then run it on Kubernetes. So here we actually talk about containerization how to actually perform, how to actually containerize an application using Docker. So we're going to be using um, a awesome quick start guide on Docker. So the reason why we're doing this is we're trying to let you see resources that you can use eventually, right? So after this workshop, you can always come back to this slide, go to these different quick start guides and assess them and work through them by yourself. So um, first thing we'll have to do is clone this repository um, to get this other repository on Docker. So what you can either do is download the zip file or clone the repository. But the actual folder we need here is just the app folder. So I'll probably recommend downloading the zip file and then copying the app folder to like your home directory where you usually put your applications. So I already have this installed on my computer. I already have this downloaded on my computer, so I'm not going to be doing that. But like I mentioned, you can either clone then um, specifically remove the app part because you run every single thing, it's going to take a lot of time. And this is just going to give you like an overview. So we don't want you to do that. So quickly get out the app um, folder and, and keep that. Or you could just download the zip file and then remove the app folder as well. Then if you go to the um, Docker quick start guide, you'd see pretty much what I just said. The first step you need to take is First thing you need to take is download the app content. So like I mentioned, clone or download the zip file. And after you've done that, we're going to create a Docker file. So how, um, remember you had to create a container image and then use a container image to create a running container. And how Docker knows or how Docker understands the, how you can create a container image is to write some sets of instructions in a Docker file. Docker would then read these instructions and use that instructions to create a container image. After this container image has been created, you would then build the container image to turn it into a working container, right? Now, when it's available as a working container, you could then access it on your computer or just push the Docker image to a registry like Docker Hub or Quay by Red Hat or any other private registry that you want to use. So to do this, we're going to copy this um, command here then go to the app folder, assuming you've been able to get that. So I'm going to cd into app because like I mentioned, I already have it already and open it. 
So again, I'm using VS Code, so that's why I can do code and the dots to open the current directory that I'm on. But if you're using IntelliJ or whatever platform, feel free to open it the way you know how to. So if I do that, it's going to open the app folder for me on VS Code. Let me expand this so it's larger for you to see. Oh, running behind time. And then here you'd see that. Um, so ideally, you'd paste that. That could be copied here. It could be copied from the um, documentation, and then you create a Docker file. So, like I mentioned, this Docker file is a set of instructions that is used to create a container image. Docker will read through all of them. What do you want? Follows it step by step, and based on that, creates a container image for you. This container image, like we mentioned, holds every information you need to create a running container. So the first section here talks about you can see the from the run working directory copy, run, and CMD. So the first command from, which is usually the first command most of the time, is saying that, hey, I want you to create this container image based off the node, node image on Docker Hub. And then the run command is pretty much some Python command that's saying, hey, I need you to run all of these things, right? So let's assume you had this application on your computer. There are certain things you need to run to make it actually work. So it does the same thing. It ensures that it gets all of those things into the container image as well. And then a working directory slash app is saying create a working directory or create a directory named app inside this container image and then copy every single thing in this um, folder into it. So the source code, the package.json, the YAML, whatever it is that made this thing run on my computer directly, copy it into that container image. So that if I send it to my colleague in Amsterdam, for instance, they won't have to say, hey, a DJ wrong. I can't find the doc, um, package of JSON, or I don't have the tools you need. Do I need to install this? They can literally just do it immediately. And then the run YAM install as production is saying, okay, now that you have all of these things working, I need to run YAM install so they can actually set up. And CMD, like you know, basically starts up the application after it works. So now that we have this Docker file on our, now that we added the Docker file to um, the application, what we need to do is build it. And to do that, we're going to be using this command called docker build-t getting started. Getting started is the name of that Docker file. And then that T is basically adding a tag to it. Like, okay, hey, we want to give this, um, this build a name, which is getting started. So if you copy that and go to a terminal and run it, it would take a couple of seconds or maybe a minute or less, depending on again, on how like the resources in your computer and how fast your internet connection is, but it would be able to create a working container image for you. So if you go to your Docker desktop now, you'd see, you'd be able to see this getting started. Um, so if you scroll down, you should find getting started in here somewhere, all right, awesome. So now you've seen I've been able to successfully create a new container image named Getting Started. Now that the container image has been created, like I mentioned earlier, what you now need to do is turn this container image into a running container. So we've been able to build this, right? We've been able to turn the first container image, which was the Docker file, into a running container by building it. And what we actually now need to do is access it directly on our computer, for instance. So now we're going to do Docker run and dash P that's DP, D basically makes your um, container run in detached mode, while that's P signify, it's used to signify the port you want it to run on. Remember when I was running the emoji boot, so I made it run on 8080, but now I want it to run on 3000. So I'm going to copy that, Docker run, um, go back to my terminal quickly and paste it. All right, cool. So if you go to localhost, it shows you the stuff. And if you go to localhost, 88, localhost 3000, you will see that we should be able to access this application on our computer. Again, we did not build this. We don't have all the necessary resources, but we can actually do this as soon as possible. So let's say one of my to-do is I um, learn about Kubernetes, for instance. I can actually add that. So this is pretty much how you containerize an application. You ensure that you create a Docker file that contains the necessary instructions you need. And based off that, you can build it into a running container. Then from that running container, you can actually like run it and access it on your computer. So the, the remember I talked about two different routes. 
I did, if we had built this Docker file and have we created the Docker file, we'd have probably built and then pushed it to Docker Hub. But we didn't go through that. We just built it and then make me run it directly on our computer. But if you want someone else in your team to access this um, container image, you'd have to push it to a registry like Docker Hub or create a private registry by just running. So with Docker, you run Docker push, the name of the container image. And if you go to Docker Hub, you will see that container image there. So all you need to do is copy the link to it, send it to your colleague, and they will to run the image and access this application directly on their computer without any stress or without installing any of those tools. Cool. So one more thing we're going to do before we go on a 10 minutes break is to try out this tool called Dive. Dive basically helps you see or like understand more about your containers. Is it, is it using an effective amount of space? Is it efficient? Is it working um, properly? So in order to install that, so we'll click on inspect a container image using the Dive tool. And it would take us to the Dive repository as well. Um, and what we'll do is quickly scroll down to uh, the part where you have to install it. Yeah, so it's the installation guide. Feel free to use your preferred method as well. But as like I mentioned earlier, I would always use Homebrew. So I've copied that and I would just like run that here, brew install dive. So it's going to install dive into my computer. And after I have it, I can use it to um, look at my um, container image that I've just created. So to use dive, all you need to do is write dive and then the name of the image, which in this case is getting started. So when we do this, is going to take a couple of seconds and it would look through and then we send some information that would be very valuable for valuable to us to check how our image is doing. Does it have the right resources? Is it going to work effectively when we share it to our colleagues and all of that? Just give it a few seconds. Awesome, it's up now. So now you can see the different um, different layers of the Docker file. And as you click on it, you see different information, right? So you can see, okay, hey, is this working? in the right part, was able to copy all the things you asked it to copy. And then you could also see the, um, the total image size. So if you're, the bigger your image size is, the slower it will work for some people, right? So if you want your image size to be 200 uh, megabytes, you can use this to check how many, um, um, like the size, right? And then if you see that it's above or below what you wanted, you can actually tweak your Docker image to meet the needs of what you want. And they could also see the image efficiency score. Here it's 99, which is pretty good. But assuming the image efficiency score was like 20 or minus one or whatever, it means that you need to fix it. So this tool is very essential to help you see how good your um, container image is and help you build or like um, update it to work or meet the standards you actually want or your team actually follows. So um, that's all for the first part of this workshop. So we'll go on a quick 10 minutes break. We know that this is a two hour workshop, so it can be hard to, um, I mean, getting a lot of information can be a bit tricky. So that's why I want you to go on a quick 10 minutes break and we will start immediately after that. The next few sessions is going to be very informative. So I totally recommend sticking around to um, listen to that part of the workshop as well. All right, thank you everyone for still staying for now. We are going to um, start the next step. So share my screen again. Um, thank you kids for sending the link to the slide. If you probably didn't get to the first time, you can click on it there and access it. So let me share my screen now. Just give me one second. All right, cool. So um, yeah, let's let's go ahead and start. Most cloud native, um, most organizations adopt cloud native development practices with the goal of shipping software faster. We've heard that Kubernetes and containerization makes it easier to 
ship software or ship new features or releases to your end users as quick as possible. However, committing and seeing the impact of code changes in a containerized environment like Kubernetes isn't as fast as it is in monolithic environments. With monolithic environments, developers can adopt web frameworks, IDE, or even tools that enable or support hot reloading. But with um, a containerized environment, you have to wait for the container to build, be pushed into a registry like Docker Hub or Quay or whichever one you're using, and then deployed into a CI or production environment before you can actually see the impact of the code changes that you've made. And this makes the once fast feedback loop with once new a distance memory. So imagine if you want to quickly um, fix something, right? After you fixed it, it takes a longer time for you to actually see if it works effectively with other microservices, right? And that makes it makes it hard for you to ship as fast as you wanted to, which is actually the goal of Kubernetes, being able to ship faster because you don't have to wait for other um, teams to um, make changes as well. So you're probably wondering how can development teams or um, personal developers actually enjoy the benefits of containerization and Kubernetes without actually going through this now slow feedback loop? How can you still enjoy these benefits while maintaining a fast feedback loop? And the answer is using a CNCF tool called Telepresence. What is Telepresence, you may ask? Telepresence is a CNCF tool that enables developers to connect their local development environment to a Kubernetes cluster to enable super easy debugging and development directly. So we're going to use a um, the quick start guide by Telepresence team. So to do that, we'll click on this URL. And like I mentioned earlier, you have to create an Ambassador Cloud account. So if you don't have that, please check in the chat. You see Kate's um, message. So once you click on that URL, you'll be able to create an Ambassador Cloud account, which would be very useful in this section. So please, if you've not done that yet, please go ahead and do that. So um, this quick start guide has a pre-configured remote cluster. So we're going to be using that cluster instead of the kind cluster we had um, created originally. So to activate this um, cluster, right, we have to click on the get a free remote cluster here. So if I click on this, what this is going to do is get me signed into Ambassador Cloud. So because I already have an account, it just says, hey, you are logged in and closes the window and brings me back here. But assuming you don't have an Ambassador Cloud account yet, you'll be required to choose your preferred sign-in method or um, sign-up method. Then after that, you'll be required to also select the team. So if you're using GitHub, you select your user your username there. You can either use GitHub or um, your Google email. So now that I've been able to activate that um, pre-configured remote cluster, the next thing I want to see is the different services that are inside this application that I want to test. So if you click on the service catalog here, service catalog is a tool or like a place that lets you see your services from like staging to production to development, right? So it makes it, it's more like a collection of these different um, services, okay? We try to reload that. Awesome. Cool. So if you go to service catalog, like I mentioned, you'll be able to see these services, the emoji service, the voting service, web app and web service. These four services make up the emoji voter application we'll be interacting with. We had initially deployed this um, emoji voter application where we're learning how about deployment and how to actually um, deploy object resources in the Kubernetes cluster. So this actual one now is that same application, but this application has a bug. So what we're going to do is fix that bug and then use telepresence to test how the service that we've just fixed or like the coaching we've just made interact with other services and see how telepresence can make it super fast for us to get feedback on what, of, of how our updated code changes actually work. Instead of having to build a container, push it and then deploy it back to actually check them. And you know when we when we were working with Docker, yeah, it was it was a bit fast because that um, Docker image and the, the code of that application was very small. Remember, I mentioned that we wanted to only use app. We didn't want to use the entire getting started because it was going to take a lot of time. And most microservices and most 
most cloud native applications usually have tons of microservices. So imagine you wanted to do that for every single change you make. The, the wait time is going to be a lot. So something that you would have done in like, um, let's say five minutes, you probably end up doing it in 10 to 20 minutes. So imagine if you can cut down that wait time while still enjoying the benefits of Kubernetes and containerization. That's pretty much what telepresence helps you achieve. So let's see how it works in action. So close this and go back to the quick start guide. Um, like I mentioned, we're using the emoji boat application. So let's click on the remote demo cluster to see how the application works. So now if I vote for the laughing emoji, I will be able to see it on the leaderboard, right? But then if I vote for the donut emoji, for instance, it throws an error basically saying, hey, you've not been able to vote for this donut. You should go and pick another one. So if I pick any other one, it's going to work. But the donut emoji isn't working. And I mean, we love donuts. So we want this donut emoji to work. So we're going to fix that um, that board and then use seller presence to test how the new code changes work with other services. Remember I mentioned we have four services here. Let me quickly go back to the service catalog to remind, yeah. The voting service, the emoji service, the web app and web service. So once we change one service, we need to be sure that this service is working effectively with other services that um, that make up this, um, this cloud native application. So do that, um, we're going to copy this command. So the fixed version of the emoji boto application has been prepackaged into a Docker container. Ideally, if we, didn't, if we had a lot of time, we would have cloned the repository, go to the code base and literally fix it. But because you are trying to ensure that you get the gist as soon as possible, we did all of that. We, we fixed the board and then we packaged that into a Docker um, container. Remember I talked about writing code in your preferred language, containerizing it. So we literally containerized it to make you run it on your computer without having to install any single thing. So to do this, we're going to copy this Docker command, go back to our terminal. And go. All right, I need to clear my screen. So one second, so you can see everything effectively. All right, cool. So if I paste this, it's going to take a couple of um, seconds. So you see it's pulling from, it's putting the letters image and then it's running telepresent. It's like launching telepresence with daemon, launching telepresence with that daemon as well. few more seconds and we should be connected to the remote cluster. While we're waiting for that, let's see if we have any questions. If I go to page, to call the UI. All right, cool. So now we've been able to connect our local development environment, which is like our workstation here to the remote Kubernetes cluster, which is the one we just created now. And you can see now we now have these services that we have seen here. The voting service, the emoji service, web app and web service now running directly on our computer. It feels like we are part of, or we are inside that remote cluster. So now that we have this setup, now that we have telepresence set up, what we need to do is create an intercept, right? And then the intercept is basically, let's, let me scroll down there first so you get to just, all right, so be before we do that, let's look at the application. So remember I mentioned that we've already built or like we've already fixed the bug and packaged into a container. When we're talking about Docker, we sh I showed you how to use the Docker file and then we had to access that um, application at localhost 3000, if you can remember. So right now we just want to confirm that this thing is working on our localhost first. And we've confirmed that, we can now test it with the other three services. So in order to do that, we'll go to localhost 8083 to see if it actually works. Like, did we actually fix it well? And remember, this is the remote cluster, right? But this is localhost. So if you click on vote on your favorite and click on the donut emoji, you see that it actually works. You can see the donut emoji here, meaning that this is the fixed or the updated version of that emoji voter application. So everything is working perfectly. You can access it on localhost. However, we can't still get the right thing here. It's still not working here on the remote cluster. So what we now need, what we want to do is test that this service we've updated, the voting service, 
is still going to interact well with the web service and the emoji services because how microservices work is they interact with different, they interact with each other, right? So if I have an authentication page, for instance, the authentication service probably would interact with the profile service to know who is getting authenticated. So in this case, we have the voting service, the emoji service, and the web service. The emoji service works with the voting service. I need to see the emoji before I can vote on it. So now that I've fixed it, I want to be sure that the voting still works effectively with the emoji service. I don't know if that makes sense. So what I'm going to do now is create an intercept with telepresence. And I'm basically saying, hey, I want it to reroute the traffic that would have gone to the voting service on the remote cluster to my local machine, because I want to see if these changes I have made is working effectively with the other three services without having to do Docker build, Docker push, deploy inside the CI or production, like none of those things, just straight up checking how it works immediately. So to do that, we're going to run a command in telepresence intercept, the name of the service, which is web, and then the port, which is 8080. So I'll copy this command, go back to my terminal, let me quickly close this up. Go back to my terminal and run it. And once I do this, there's a couple of, okay, it's telling me that there's telepresence, there's an updated telepresence version. So that's, we don't have to worry about that. Um, I mean, you could always update the new one, but yeah, so it's going to ask a couple of questions because it needs this information to create the right um, headers and like the right, um, using the right ingress controller. So I'm currently using a mystery ingress, which is like about traffic. So I would, I would use the ambassador, the ambassador here. It picks up the actual stuff. So since it's the actual thing, I could have just left it as default, so just copy and paste it. So I want the ingress card. The ingress is at port 80, so I'll write 80, and it's not using um, TLS, so I'm going to say no. If it was, I would say, I would type in Y, which means yes. And I would also paste the ambassador, ambassador here. And what that would do is generate a preview URL for me, which, would show me how my updated service, the code changes I have made, actually works with the other three services in the remote cluster. So just give it a couple of seconds and it should be up in no time. I'm sure that I keep in the time. Okay, it doesn't make sense. Um, just, okay, it is working now. Awesome. So now if I go to this um, secured URL, I can actually see um, how my service would interact with the other three services because I created an intercept saying that, hey, I needed to reroute every single traffic that is being sent to that um, service that I updated in the remote cluster to my local machine. So um, on, this, on this remote cluster here, every services here right now, the services in the remote cluster, the voting service, the emoji service, they're all directly in the remote cluster. But if I paste this preview URL here, what I'm actually seeing now is the updated service on my local machine working with the other three services in the remote cluster. So now I can test to see how this how it is working. Is it actually working with the other services in the remote cluster? If I eventually push this thing, would the users be able to access my application effectively? Or would I realize that there's a bug somewhere and has to come back and, and, and fix it all over again? So let's test it out, moment of truth. So if we click on the, let's try to vote for any other emoji for a start. So if you vote for this, you'd see that, oh, it showed well. And if we vote for the, if we vote for the emoji, sorry, the donuts, you'd see that it has also been updated. We now have two donuts, meaning that we've been able to confirm that our code update and code changes it's actually working effectively with the other services in my remote cluster. So now I can send this preview URL to my teammate or my manager, who's ever supposed to review my code changes to tell the person to quickly review it if they are comfortable with it. I can now push a commit and that can be shipped to production immediately. We don't have to build the container and run it directly on our computers. Again, you could have tons of services. This application just has four services, right? Most farming applications have more than that, hundreds and thousands of them. So our computers can only do so much. 
as much as you're trying to code, you're also trying to respond to a Slack message or reading an email. So your computer is sharing all of these resources. So it can be hard for you to do all of that and so run hundreds of services directly on it as well. It's going to make it very, very slow and sometimes even impossible to work. So that's how telepresence helps you do awesome things, get feedback with immediately, share, um, share a secure URL with your colleagues for easy collaboration. They can check it out if they are not comfortable with, with it. You can quickly go back and fix it, send the preview URL to them again. And once everybody in the team is comfortable with the coaching that you've made, you can then ship it, like send the commit in and will be pushed to your staging or production environment. Um, is there any questions before we move ahead? We have success. Okay, I think Daniel has covered that. Thank you, Daniel, for responding to the question. Happy to All right, so we're <laughs> All right, so we're going to uh, quickly cover continuous integration as fast as possible because we are way, way behind time. And continuous integration is a really interesting thing you also need to know as someone who is diving into Kubernetes. And GitHub has a fantastic um, documentation about it. So we're going to use that here. Again, like I mentioned, the reason why we're going to these resources is we want you to know that they exist. We want you to be able to find them eventually. So continuous integration is a software practice that requires or encourages frequently committing code to a shared repository. Instead of having to wait for one month before you commit your code, you commit it as soon as possible. And some of the benefits of this is that it enables merge, it, like it reduces merge conflict. Assuming Daniel and I worked on a certain engineering team, right? So Daniel has been working on his code for like one month and then also working on my own code code base for one month. We are both working on the same code base, but we are fixing different things. Chances are I'll probably delete something that Daniel is trying to improve, right? And because I have been doing this for one month, Daniel has no idea, right? So when we now eventually push our code, there will be lots of merge config. It will be so hard for us to figure out what is going on because this is the code that has been updated for an entire month. That's going to be like a lot of code changes. So continuous integration is a motion that you should commit your code as soon as possible. Hours, minutes, days, right? It shouldn't take a lot of time because it enables you to reduce the amount of time you have to debug or find an error or make like certain code changes. And then we have um, a couple of different organizations that have tools for continuous integration and continuous delivery. Um, we're going to look at some of them that are actually supported or actually involved in the CNCF space. So I'll click on that URL, which would take me to the CNCF landscape for CICD. And you can see different interesting tools like Argo, Fox, Harness, GitLab, GitHub Action, Jenkins, and the rest of them. If you want to use a CICD tool that is specific to um, the CNCF foundation, then you should use the ones that are highlighted in blue because it means that they're actually under CNCF. But every other one that are not highlighted in this blue, line are tools owned by corporations who actually like GitHub for instance, we all know GitHub and GitHub. So they also have their own version of CICD. So in this section, we're going to actually be using GitHub Actions. So I'm going to click on GitHub Actions here and then click on the website to assess it. So GitHub Actions basically provides a way for you to automate your workflow from idea to production. So when you um, push commits, right? So let's assume I have fixed the bug in emoji voter and I want to push it to, um, to, to the repository, right? So I can set a certain flow that ensures that every single person uses the right, um, right like alignment or ensures that if there's no white space, it could, it could be something complex, maybe have I written test or have I done certain things that I need to do to ensure that my application is very secured. So GitHub Actions enables you to do some really interesting stuff. We're going to cover like a quick overview, but there's so much more you can do with it actually. So if you click on get started with actions and click on the quick start guide, we're going to access it. And how GitHub actions work is you need to have a directory called .github. And then inside that .github directory, you have another one called workflows, where you can now create different workflows for your application. So let's go to, let's go back to our slide and click on the deploy a lightweight CI pipeline. 
which will take us to a sample repository. Feel free to do this with your own repository. You don't have to use this one. So what I want to do now is click on actions. We actually have one here. So I'm just going to quickly delete that so we can just like create one from scratch now. All right, so let's go back to code and click on new file. So I want to create a .github um, slash workflow file as specified here. So I'm going to copy this, go back here and paste it. And if you add a slash, just create the next, um, next section for you. So now that we've created the .github slash workflows directory, what we want to do is create a file named github dash actions dash demo dot yaml. This is where we actually include the set of instructions. What do we want this action file to do? So I'm going to copy that and paste it here. So basically I've created a GitHub folder, workflows folder, and then this is the file inside the workflows folder. And then we go back, we're going to copy the content of this YAML file and paste it here. So quick overview, obviously this is the name of the, the file. It could be anything, it could be learning Kubernetes, it could be um, ensuring there is test on this application, whatever it is that fits your usage or what you're trying to do, feel free to um, update that. And then the push here is saying, hey, I want this um, event to happen once something is being pushed into this repository. So like a, a commit, right? We're putting, pushing something into this repository. This is when I want you to kickstart this event. And then the runs on here is basically saying that this is going to run on an Ubuntu um, server. And then different steps is what you want it to do. So first of all, I wanted to run Echo. This job was automatically triggered by a GitHub event. And then you can see the name, the uses, what, why it's happening. And then a couple of other interesting, like run this and run that. This is very basic. It doesn't cover a lot of things, but like I mentioned, you can use this for really, really complex stuff, like checking Lintard or checking like tests. I mean, it's also very efficient or useful when you're working with like open source organization. You know, we have so many contributors. So you want to ensure that every contributor is pulling a certain format in their in the way that code is written. So instead of manually commenting on every on every pull request, hey, you did not do this right. Please go and do this. You can set up this, and if when they send a, a, a pull request or push to the repository and realize that it fails, they can immediately identify what the problem is, go back to their code base, fix the issue, and send another um, another PR again. So now that we've, we've done that, what we want to do is commit the new file. So we're going to create, click on create a new branch for this commit starter pull request. So if we click on propose new file, it's going to move us to the actions workflow where you'd see that original file that I had deleted. So if we go back here, so we're going to create a pull request. And you see that it's already loading. It's like use of actions demo, the header rules, this content. And if you click on this, you see it say successful in five seconds, meaning that whatever test we had set or whatever thing instructions we had given has been successful. So assuming that we set up um, something that, that ensures that I didn't add any full stop in my code, this is just a very random example. If I had added a full stop in my code base, it wouldn't have passed. This would have been like an X saying, hey, this was not able to run successfully. So if I come here, I can easily identify that that is what the issue is without asking any maintainer or any of my colleagues. I can quickly go back, fix that issue and move ahead with the next step. So if we try to open this, you see the different flows we followed. The current um, um, operating system, um, virtual environment, GitHub permissions and all that fantastic stuff. So this is pretty much how GitHub Actions work. And like I mentioned, it's just a quick overview to just let you understand how you can use GitHub Actions to perform continuous integration. But if you want to go deeper into this, feel free to click on this resource here and you'd see the quick start guide, you see more complex stuff and you can actually um, check them out in detail. It is very useful and can come in handy on certain situations. Um, I'll quickly check if there's any question. I don't think there's any question. All right. 
Okay, wrapping up, we've covered a lot of things in this workshop, a lot of them. So far, we've been able to talk about the meaning of Kubernetes and its basic concept, how to configure a local development environment for Kubernetes using kind of QB. You've also learned how to perform containerization by packaging your code into containers with Docker. You've learned how to improve your coding feedback loop with telepresence. And finally, how to perform continuous integration with GitHub Action. We know that learning Kubernetes can be very challenging for some people, right? So I just want to let you know that we are here for you. And by we, I mean all of us at Ambassador Lab. We created a resource where you can find information about Kubernetes from like how to use it in terms of coding, shipping and running your applications. So if you're interested in checking out this or like diving deeper into Kubernetes, do click on this um, link on the slide or go to getambassador.io slash Kubernetes Learning Center and you see some really great resources, written text, videos, and some challenges that you can work on as well. And based on, on those things, you can actually improve your skills on Kubernetes. If you have any questions, we have a Developer Learning Center Slack channel on our Slack at a8r.io slash Slack. So you could join in there and ask us your questions. And I or Daniel or anybody from our team would be happy to respond to you because we're really um, keen on helping you understand Kubernetes. So we're like here for you to answer any questions you may have. Thank you so much for staying up to the end of this workshop. Like I mentioned, you can join our Slack channel at AFR.io. You can follow me on Twitter at DVCodes or you can ask me questions there as well. You can also check out my blog at djonsipo.com. So if you have any final questions, this would be a great time for you to ask. Feel free to drop the questions in the Slack channel or you can turn on your audio and ask the question as well. What Cindy's going for is that if you join us on Slack at aar.io slash Slack, we have a developer learning center channel, which is a great yeah. place to ask all your questions when you're getting started with Kubernetes. Uh, Cindy's in there, Daniel's in there, Adidion's in there. Um, you can drop any questions in there. We monitor that Slack channel pretty much 20, well, maybe not 24 seven, but pretty frequently. <laughs> <laughs> um, so you can follow up yeah. with us there and then Daniel is hosting a workshop again tomorrow on continuous delivery so you can hop in and make sure that you come back same time tomorrow and we will see you then